Yeah, so, so let me uh, go, go to the next uh, presentation, which is uh, by Yiru Wang uh, from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, and the discussion is going to be from uh, Juan Herrano from uh, UC Davis. The floor is yours. Okay, so first I want to thank the organizers for um, including our project in this wonderful um, program. Um, it's a pleasure to present this work, Has the Phillips Curve Flattened and Why? This work is joined with Atsushi Inoue from Vanderbilt University and Barbara Rossi from UPF, Barcelona School of Economics, and Cray. And in this project, um, we use a time-varying parameter, novel econometrics technique, to study the structural Phillips curve. Okay. The correlation between the inflation and unemployment rate um, has always been an essential research question. And recently, there is large uh, literature studying the correlation, and they find disconnectedness between the two. So especially around the 1990s and also in the years after the financial crisis. So given this substantial um, evidence of this decreasing correlation, it might be natural to ask, why did this correlation decrease? So there are several conjectures in the literature. Could this decreasing correlation be due to the flattening of the slope of the Phillips curve? Could it be due to the endogenous monetary policy? Or could it be due to the mismeasurement in the inflation or the economic slack? Okay. So it is essential to figure out why the correlation is decreasing, and it is highly re policy relevant to verify whether the Phillips curve is indeed becoming flat. So in this context, we are trying to study the structural Phillips curve and to verify whether the slope of the Phillips curve is indeed becoming flat. Okay. So one of the main um, challenges in the estimation of the Phillips curve is endogeneity. To handle this issue of endogeneity, there are two typical approaches used. One is to estimate the Phillips curve as part of the structural model. For example, the structural VAR or the DSG model. Another approach is to focus on the Phillips curve directly, and we use instruments to handle the endogenous variables. Regarding the first approach, um, when there's uh, instabilities in either the model or the data, there's a lot of work focusing on the time-varying parameter counterpart of the econometric technique. For example, the time-varying parameter VAR model. Okay. However, this type of estimation procedure is full information estimation procedure. So any misspecification in the remaining part of the model might affect the estimation of the Phillips curve itself. So in this context, we focus on the second approach, which use, which use the instruments to handle the endogeneity. So this method is a limited information IV approach used in the literature uh, in the papers by Gali and co-authors. So the advantage of this IV approach is that it will be robust to the misspecification in the remaining part of the model. And also from our knowledge, how to address the time variation in this type of limited information IV model is not as much explored as the first one, the full information estimation procedure. So in this context, we fill in the gap in the literature by proposing this time varying parameter limited information IV model, and we use this estimation procedure to study the Phillips curve. Okay. So just before I move on to the empirical results, let me summarize the contribution of this paper. So methodologically, we use this novel time-varying structural Phillips curve um, estimation procedure using instruments. And from our knowledge, this method is novel in considering the time variation in the IV estimation procedure. And this method is based on our companion methodology paper introducing the time-varying parameter local projection using external instruments. So we consider smooth time variation in both the slope parameter and also the variance-covariance parameter in this uh, procedure. 
Um, also, things in the Phillips curve setting, one of the main issue people face is the weak instruments problem. So in this context, we also extend this methodology so that to provide estimates and confidence bands robust to weak IV. Okay. Empirically, we use this method and find that there is indeed a flattening in the Phillips curve. And the decrease in this correlation is not due to endogenous monetary policy. And also, we find this decrease dates back to the 1980s. And, but however, in the recent uh, pandemic period, um, the structural Phillips curve is well and alive again. So just a summary of the comparison with the literature. So compared with the reduced form time varying parameter approach, our method addressed the endogeneity problem. So it focused on the structural part rather than the reduced form correlation. And compared with the semi-structural time varying approach and the structural model estimated in given subsamples, our method will be robust to the misspecification in the remaining part of the model. And compared with the IV estimation in given subsamples, our method proposes a more, um, more general type of time variation for the full sample, which is also the main contribution from the methodological um, perspective. Okay. So let me uh, skip the details of the literature, and we move on to the empirical results. So in this context, we uh, study three main concepts, the Phillips correlation, the Phillips curve, and the Phillips multiplier. All of them are measurements of the correlation between inflation and unemployment rate. And for each of these exercises, we focus on the model, uh, model specification uh, used, commonly used in the literature so that we can compare our time varying results with the existing results. So we first start with this Phillips correlation, and we focus on Stock and Watson's uh, definition and model specification. On the left-hand side, we focus on the four-quarter change in the four-quarter average inflation, and inflation is measured by cold PCE. And on the right-hand side, we have this XT, which is a measure of the slack. So here, for example, it can be unemployment gap and also we can use other measurement of the economic slack. And the beta one here, in our framework, this is time varying, beta one T, measures the time varying Phillips correlation. Okay. So here, in this plot, the black line reports the Stock and Watson's constant parameter results in subsamples over time, and the red line reports our time varying parameter estimate of this beta 1t over time. And the dotted lines are the corresponding 90% confidence bands. So from this figure, we can see that based on both the constant parameter results in subsamples and our time varying parameter pass estimate, this beta 1t in absolute value is decreasing over time. So that means there is a flattening Phillips correlation especially if we focus on the time varying pass estimator, the red line, we can see that after 1990s, so the value is insignificantly from zero, which means that the correlation almost disappeared in the recent period. We also use other measurement of economic slack and we find robust results. So we find this flattening Phillips, co Phillips correlation but it doesn't necessarily imply we also have a flattening Phillips curve because one measures the reduced form correlation, the other looks at the structural correlation. Okay. So next, we look at the structural Phillips curve directly and to see whether the, there is also this flattening um, pattern. Our benchmark model is the hybrid nucleation Phillips curve in the papers by Galli and co-authors. So left-hand side, pi t denotes the inflation, and the, on the right-hand side, we have future inflation or expected information and lagged information, as well as the xt, the forcing variable. So as for the model specification, inflation is measured by GDP deflator, follows the paper by Galli and co-authors. As for the forcing variable, we use the unemployment gap 
So here we use this unemployment gap because we use it throughout the exercise in Phillips correlation, this Phillips curve, as well as the Phillips multiplier as exercise to be discussed shortly. So we make it uniform. And for the future inflation or the expected inflation, here we use the three quarter ahead SPF forecast of PGDP inflation. And the IV set include two legs of the unemployment gap and the output gap. So the statistics imply that our instruments are strong in this particular specification. And we use our time variant parameter IV approach, which provides a pass estimator, which is a, a weighted average minimizing pass estimator. Okay. So let's show the results of the parameters. In this figure, we plot the time varying lambda t, which is the coefficient before the forcing variable. Again, the black line reports the results from the constant parameter model, and the red line reports our time varying parameter pass estimator of lambda t. So again, we can see that lambda t in absolute value decreases over time. So it decreased from uh, 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.12 to around 0 0.04. And also after around 1990s, um, lambda, lambda t is becoming indistinguishable from zero, so it almost disappeared. That means there is a flattening of this Phillips curve. We also plot gamma f, which is our forward-looking inflation parameter, the coefficient before um, future inflation. So here, this gamma f is slightly decreasing over time okay, compared with the uh, constant parameter results. And we plot our gamma bt, which is the backward-looking inflation parameter, so the parameter before lagged inflation, here, this gamma B is fluctuating around um, 0 0.68. So it increased a little bit, but remains constant most, most of the time. Okay. Okay. So just a summary, our results confirm that there is a flattening of the slope of the Phillips curve, which is lambda t. In absolute value, it is decreasing over time. And in recent period, it is indistinguishable from zero. And we find the importance of forward-looking component has slightly decreased in this specification. And the importance of the backward-looking component is, um, remain, is remaining constant over time, slightly increasing. So apart from these two exercises, the Phillips correlation and the structural Phillips curve, we do one more exercise in studying the Phillips multiplier which is proposed in Banjian and Meister's paper as an alternative measurement of the trade-off between inflation and unemployment rates. So here is how we estimate the multiplier. For the horizon age, we regress the cumulative inflation on the cumulative unemployment. And the capital P here reflects the Phillips multiplier. And in Banjian and Meister's paper, this P can be a ratio of the impulse responses of infl cumulative inflation and cumulative unemployment to monetary policy shock. And in our exercise, we estimate this equation two using monetary policy shock as instruments for this cumulative um, unemployment. So here, let me show you the results. This plot, we plot the Phillips multiplier across horizons. So the x-axis reflects the H horizon for the impulse response and horizon for the Phillips multiplier. The black line reports Benjamin and Meister's constant parameter model results. And the red lines report our time varying parameter estimate across horizons, but for different periods. So you can see a family of red lines here. They are for different periods. Our results share a similar pattern as their constant parameter model results. And also at the beginning, it is uh, slightly positive due to the lagged reaction to the monetary policy shocks. And after horizon for uh, when H equals 12, the value of the multiplier is becoming negative. And to have a clear review of the time variation for this multiplier, we plot here 
the multiplier for horizon age equals 12. Again, we follow their specification and do the same exercise, but using our time varying parameter technique. The, the left-hand side plot the results using the pre-1990 subsample. The black line reports their constant parameter results, and the red lines report our time varying parameter pass estimator. And the, on the right-hand side, this is the result based on the post-1990 subsample. So clearly, we have similar results that after 1990, the time variant parameter pass estimator for the multiplier is also um, decreasing. So it is uh, much smaller compared with the results for the pre-1990 subsample. Okay. So just to summarize, we study three correlations here. It seems that the flattening of the structural Phillips curve is a robust result. No matter we consider the Phillips correlation, the Phillips multiplier, or the slope of the structural Phillips curve. So it seems robust for us. So remember that one of the interesting questions we are interested in is whether this decreasing correlation is due to monetary policy. There are many papers studying this because a more responsive monetary policy might tighten monetary policy more when it perceives inflation to be increasing. And this might cause unemployment rate to rise so that uh, it will bias the slope of the Phillips curve towards zero. There are many papers studying this. So in this Phillips curve setting, when there is no endogeneity bias or no measurement error, the correlation should be the same as the slope of the Phillips curve. However, the sad thing is we have the endogeneity problem, but this problem can be solved using good instruments. Okay. So, so if we have good instruments, the IV estimate can still be consistent, trustable. Okay. Our previous exercise actually rely on good instruments, so we have several test statistics for it. The Hansen statistics imply that the instruments are valid conditional on the maintained assumption that a subset of the instruments are valid. Besides, Garnick's and co-authors weak IV robust interval imply that this IV is strong IV for this specification. And also, Lewis and Merton's weak IV test also imply we have strong IV for the specification chosen. So, however, there are many specifications considered in this literature that are weak instruments. So to make our methods also work in this type of specification so that we can compare with the existing results, we also extend our methodology to be robust to weak IV. So the, the intuition is that even though we cannot estimate the structural parameter because of the weak IV, but we can always estimate the reduced form parameters, and then we can recover this structural parameter based on the reduced form parameters. Then we can draw from the distribution of the reduced form parameters and repeatedly recover the structural parameters. This will give us um, uh, estimates and also confidence bands robust to weak IV. I hide the technical details, those are in the paper. Okay. And with this method, robust to weak IV, we investigate two more specifications considered in the literature. One is to use monetary policy shocks as IV. The other is the specification considered in the papers by Galli and co-authors. So the first specification considers using monetary policy shock as instruments. We consider the hybrid Phillips curve specification in Banishan and Meister's paper. Okay. This pi t is the annualized quarter to quarter inflation, the co PCE. And on the right hand side, we have the four quarter average for future inflation as well as the lagged inflation. And for the forcing variable, we also consider the unemployment gap. Uh, this is the forcing variable in their paper, in their specification. But, and also the instruments considered is the same, that is the current monetary policy and 20 lakhs. Okay. So let's show the results of our time varying parameter 
pass estimator of the slope of the Phillips curve. Again, the black line reports their constant parameter results, while the red line reports our time-varying parameter results using the monetary policy shocks as instruments. So we can see that, again, there is this flattening of this lambda t. Lambda t in absolute value is decreasing over time. Okay. So this means that we have this, um, we have this pattern of flattening of Phillips curve, even though using monetary policy as instruments. And also after around 1985, also close to 1990, we can see that um, this value of lambda t is insig insignificant from zero. So we have robustness, we have robustness, robust results if, if we consider this specification, which is considered in the literature. Another specification we look into is the one in the literature considered in the papers by Galli and co-authors. This is a hybrid nucleation Phillips curve with one lack of inflation, so the same as we showed before. This inflation is measured by GDP deflator. And we also consider unemployment gap here uh, rather than labor share considered in their specific specification. As for the instruments, the number of lags considered in this instrument set follows their guidance. So we consider four lags of inflation and two lags of unemployment gap, and two lags of wage inflation, two lags of unemployment gap. The statistics show that this set of instruments is actually weak. So we have to use our um, method robust to weak IV. Let me show you the results. So here is the time varying parameter pass of the lambda t, okay, with the confidence bands robust to weak IV. So again, we can see that there is this de decrease in pattern in the absolute value of lambda t. Okay. So that means um, by looking at other specifications in the literature, we still find this flattening Phillips curve which imply that our results are robust. Another question which is interesting is that, what about the Phillips curve during the recent pandemic? So to study this, we focus on the Phillips curve, the specification we just mentioned, the one inspired by the papers by Gali and co-authors. And we extend the sample to include the recent financial crisis as well as the recent pandemic. So the sample ends until 2022, actually. This is still a hybrid nucleation Phillips curve with one lack of inflation. And the fourth invariable we consider, again, the same, the unemployment gap. Okay. As for the instruments, it's the same as the one we showed before, that is four lakhs of inflation and two lakhs of unemployment gap, wage inflation, and output gap. And again, we find that the instruments are weak, so we need to use our time-varying parameter pass estimator robust to weak IV. So here is our plot of the time varying parameter pass of this lambda t. We can see that different from the pictures before, this lambda t in absolute value is decreasing, so going towards zero at the beginning. But after 2000, well, mid 2000, I will say, it starts to increase again in absolute value especially in the recent financial crisis and the recent pandemic, it seems this lambda t is going back to the level before, which implies that the Phillips curve is well and alive again. Okay. So this is our finding in the slope of the Phillips curve for this um, extended sample. We also plot our time varying parameter pass for the forward looking inflation parameter so this is gamma f, which is the parameter before the future inflation. We can see that there is an increasing pattern here in this specification with this sample. And also, we plot our backward-looking inflation parameter in the structural Phillips curve. So this is a gamma b, which is the parameter before um, the lag inflation. 
we can see that there is a decreasing pattern in this gamma B with this specification using this sample. Okay. So let me summarize the empirical results for this um, specification. Our results confirm that the Phillips curve is becoming alive and well again, especially in the recent financial crisis and in the recent pandemic period. It seems that at the beginning, the Phillips curve, the slope, in absolute value is going towards zero, but after the mid-2000s, the slope has started to increase again. Besides, we find that the importance of the forward-looking component, the gamma F, has slightly increased. And the trend after, during the great moderation has become even stronger and to the recent estimate is going back to the level before 1990s. Be find, be, be, beside, we find that the importance of the backward looking component, gamma B here, has weakened substantially. So, so we find this downward trend started since 1970s. Okay. So this is, um, um, what we find the main access, empirical exercise in our, um, in our context. Let me finally conclude and I will stop here. So in this context, we propose a flexible time varying parameter model using instruments. This is a, normal, a novel approach consider local time variation in both the slope and the variance covariance parameters. So from our knowledge, to address time variation in the IV model, this method is new. And we apply this methodology to study the structural Phillips curve and contribute to the debate of the instability of this relationship between inflation and unemployment rate. We find that there is indeed flattening of the slope of the Phillips curve. And the weakening of the correlation between inflation and Phillips curve is not due to endogenous monetary policy, but due to the flattening of the Phillips curve. Besides, we find that this decreasing correlation started since around 1980s. However, in the recent um, financial crisis, especially during the recent pandemic, the slope of the Phillips curve has increased again, so it becomes well and alive again. Besides, just to address that our approach compared with the literature considers the endogeneity problem, address this, and also we consider the potential time variation in the environment, so this is a time varying parameter approach. Besides, our approach will be robust to misspecification in the remaining parts of the full information approach, which is an advantage. And in the end, in this context, we make this method robust to weak instruments. So this is the main issue people face in estimating, in estimating the Nucasian Phillips curve. So that's more or less our um, uh, contribution from both the methodological part and the empirical part. I think I might be a bit ahead of time, right? Uh, just one minute. So, so just to stress here, um, here in our companion uh, methodology paper, we introduce this time varying parameter local projection framework considering using external instruments. And in this paper, we use this novel methodology to deal with the uh, instrument variable in the Nucasian Phillips curve. So the methodology is new and we wish that we can um, use this method to study more empirical questions, especially like the monetary policy and also uh, the Nucasian Phillips curve. I will leave the remaining uh, time for questions, maybe. And thank you for attention. Good, so um, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation. I've learned a lot. And thanks to uh, you for corresponding with me extensively over the past few weeks and sharing your code. That made my life way easier. Um, so let me try to, to put the, the paper into context. So, so here I'm. I'm showing you this evidence on the quote unquote Phillips correlation. So here I'm just borrowing this idea from Stock and Watson in the way to present the data. We should take like an agnostic view about the driver between this variation between inflation and unemployment. So what I'm showing you here is on the x-axis a moving average on, of the unemployment gap, so the difference between the unemployment rate 
and a non-cyclical estimate of the unemployment rate. Um, and on the y-axis, I'm showing you a moving average of year-over-year -year change in core PC inflation. And so I'm, I'm, I'm plotting the data on a set of like four superiors, 1960 to 83, 84, 99, 2000, 2019, and the recent um, three years or so. And so if you, if you focus on, on the blue line, which shows the data from 1960 to 1983, and, and this considers like a large part of recent monetary history in the US in which a lot happened. So you have the Great Society in there, you have the Nixon price controls, you have supply shocks, you have the Volcker disinflation. Then if you compute this Phillips correlation, this relationship between the unemployment gap and year over year changes in inflation, you would conclude that they were quote unquote strong. And now if you move um, forward in time, so after the, 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 the Volcker disinflation, so that's the orange line, then the linear feed between variations in the unemployment gap and changes in inflation rates became weaker. And if you go further in time to the period 2000, 2019, they seem to be even weaker. And in the last three years, uh, the slope of this Phillips correlation seems to be very similar to what it was um, from 1960 to 1983. Okay, so, so now this, this change in this correlation of, 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 um, between inflation and unemployment could be driven by a myriad of factors. The main culprit tends to be the slope of the Phillips curve. But um, you could also have that other blocks in your model, your model economy that you have in your mind, also change through like this very long period of time, right? So, so this literature discusses extensively the effect of, for example, cost push shocks that are going to independently change inflation. You can have changes in long-term inflation expectations and also study, for example, the, the effect of how those long-term inflation expectations are determined. For example, Laura taught us about that yesterday. Or you could have changes in the relative variance of demand and supply shocks, and because you need demand variation in order to understand the Phillips curve, for example, something like an improvement in the conduct of monetary policy would make it look as if the Phillips curve had flattened when in reality it didn't. So, so to understand this a little bit uh, better, let me start with, uh, with the New Keynesian formalization of the Phillips curve, in which you, you have that inflation has three main drivers. The first one is going to be inflation expectations, which is just this notion that if people expect that in the future inflation is going to be higher, they're going to want to increase prices today, which is going to push inflation today. Then you have cost push shocks, and then you have like this Phillips term, which is going to translate this notion that in a booming economy, as market, labor markets become tighter, wages are going to increase, marginal costs are going to increase, which are going to pass through inflation. And uh, and, and the object of interest here is going to be in the terminology that you and her co-authors have is going to be lambda, which is going to be the slope of the Phillips curve or how much demand variation is going to pass through inflation. And from this very simple example, you're going to notice that estimating the Phillips curve is actually quite a challenging task because you need to isolate demand variation. That's what the model asks you to have. And the second one is that inflation expectations are an, an endogenous object. So you might say, well, we're taking this textbook formulation of the Nikensian Phillips curve a little bit too seriously. So you might want to relax the formulation by, for example, instead of having this Calbo micro foundation inflation expectations, you might have like a hybrid Phillips curve in which you allow for some forward lookiness, but you also allow for either some price indexation or you allow for a share of consumers or firms that have backward looking expectations. So you have then like this hybrid Phillips curve that I'm plotting here in the second, that I'm, I'm writing down in the second line. And then you might have the question, well, this, the structure of the economy might be changing, so the gammas and the lambda might be changing as well. So we might want to account for that, and that's what you and her co-authors do, which is to allow for a flexible variation of these structural parameters, which is, in principle, a, a very interesting thing to do. Um, so this is, this is the main result. This is figure two in, in, in their paper. I'm going to show this figure a number of times. Uh, but the main message that I want you to focus for now is only on the point estimate, which if you were to start um, your inquiry in something like 1970, then you would have a Phillips curve coefficient, a slope of something like minus 0.12. And if you go to the most, to the pre-Great Recession era, then this number would be like minus 0.04. And the question that I'm going to start asking is, how important is this degree of flattening only in the point estimate, taking the identification as given? So, so I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna do something that is, um, that is very simple. 
So I'm going to take the formulation of the Phillips curve, and then I'm going to abstract from the variation of inflation that is explained by expectations. Okay, so this would be inflation minus inflation expectations minus past inflation. And then I'm going to do something that is very simple, which is to plot the variation that would be explained by the Phillips term, allowing first for the, Philip, the slope of the Phillips curve to change. This is this lambda t hat that you know, and Herrick authors estimated. And then I'm also good, going to do the same, but imposing a constant parameter value of lambda bar. I'm going to do this using the same sample that they do in the paper, using the same data, SPF, core PCE, the unemployment gap. And the only difference is that I'm going to show you figures using annual inflation as opposed to quarterly inflation. So I'm going to multiply their estimates of lambda by four, which is just like the time aggregation factor that comes up when you move from quarterly to annual inflation. And, and, and so this is the result of, uh, of this exercise. So in the, in the x-axis, I'm plotting time. And in the y-axis, I'm showing lambda times the unemployment gap for two different series. The black line, which allows for the slope of the Phillips curve to change in the way that, it, that they estimate that it did and for a constant parameter value, lambda bar. And the main message that I want to show you is that these lines behave quite similarly. So except for the variation in 1974, in which the difference in this, the constant parameter and the variable, variable parameter value give you a difference of something like 0.5 percentage points in, in inflation, then the, for the rest of, of the period from 1970 to 2009, the series look very similarly. So, so my, my, main, my first comment is, is about the interpretation. Um, and what I get from that figure is that although the change in slope in point estimate might be there, that's um, comment number one, I would conclude that it's quantitatively small. Um, this is consistent with what we find in alternative, in, in our work using um, cross-state data in the US in a similar time period that starts a little bit later from 1977 to 2017. Okay, so, so, so the next thing that I want to do is to, is to put these estimates a little bit into perspective. So here I'm, I'm borrowing this table from Mavridis, Blackburn, Muller, and Stock 2014. And I'm using the fact that your hair authors do this amazing thing in which they run these regressions with different pool variables. So here I'm using their specification that uses the labor share as opposed to the unemployment gap. And I'm laying over these estimates in the literature about the slope of the Phillips curve in the y-axis and the forward-looking component of the Phillips curve in the y-axis. The estimates of this main result that you represented, here I'm abstracting from variation in the forward-looking component of inflation, and I'm showing you the constant parameter value here in blue, this is this little dot, and then in orange, I'm showing you the extent of time variation in the estimation of lambda that the authors get. So what I'm going to conclude here is something very similar to what I concluded before, which is that their estimates are um, quote unquote in line with this meta-analysis of what the literature has found before. Um, so so my, sec my second comment is that the paper would benefit a lot from discussing what a reasonable benchmark about the time variation would be. The most natural one in my opinion, is to compare the time variation against the model that imposes a constant parameter value. And my argument here is that in the preferred specification, this constant parameter point estimate is not rejected by the confidence bands. So I'm going to show you that. So this is the, main fi the same figure that I showed you before. So I have here the point estimate of the time, parameter, uh, time, uh, time varying parameter model with 90% confidence bars in here and then the constant parameter value. And the message here is that if you use this metric that I propose, then this point estimate doesn't happen to be rejected throughout the whole sample. Um, but maybe there, there is another metric that is more interesting than the one that I'm proposing, but I think the, the paper would benefit a lot from having a metric about that. Okay, and so, uh, so my, my third comment is going to be about sensitivity of specification choice and weak instruments. So when you, when you run these regressions, you, you, you have to face, and they do in a very systematic way, the choice that you have out there, many potential instruments that you could use. You have many potential lag structures that you could use. 
there are many driver variables that you could possibly use in order to estimate the Phillips curve. And, and these different choices about instruments, lag structures, specifications, end up matter for the number that you estimate. So this is not a new problem of their method. This is the same problem that the literature that uses, that imposes a constant Phillips curve faces when estimating lamp, what I call lambda bar in the time series. And you can think about this as a manifestation of both a weak instrument problem and perhaps the issue that finding a valid instrument is very challenging. So let me explain about that a little bit. So you, when you are estimating the Phillips curve, you have to confront two endogeneity issues. The first one is that expect inflation expectations are endogenous. And not only inflation expectations are endogenous, but inflation is very hard to forecast in, at the high frequency. So when you need to find an instrument of a variable that is predetermined in the past in order to forecast, for example, present inflation, you oftentimes find that variables that are predetermined make a very poor job in forecasting future inflation. So that's problem number one. And problem number two is that the Phillips curve asks you to have demand variation in order to estimate the responses of unemployment on inflation. And that is, quote unquote, hard to do because, uh, for example, monetary policy makes the job of trying to eliminate such fluctuations in demand. And in general, because we know that supply variation also is an important driver of both the business cycle and, um, and, and inflation. So here, I, I have the question of whether this, this problem that, in my opinion, is well known in the literature, this issue of coming up with valid, strong instruments to estimate the Phillips curve, is compounded by trying to estimate a, a time variable um, parameter model. So for example, I'm gonna give you an, an example about this. So imagine that you're trying to estimate the Phillips curve using variation coming from, let's say, monetary policy shocks, um, coming from, let's say, rumor, rumor shocks. So you need variation in monetary policy that is exogenous throughout time, but then you have the trouble that as you move farther and farther away from, for example, the Volcker disinflation, these shocks become smaller and smaller. So you not only have a, time, a, a weak instrument problem, but perhaps when you move in the time dimension, your instruments are, become, are going to become weaker and weaker. So, so I think you, you, you see some of that in, in, in the evidence, um, in the results that you and her co-authors produce. So I'm gonna show you a number of different specifications that they show, that, that, that they show in, in, in their paper, which I think is, is fantastic value, in order to understand how important this issue might be. So here I'm repeating for the third time the same figure. Uh, so this, this uses data from this 1970 to 2008, using hack robust uh, standard errors, 90% confidence intervals, using the unemployment gap, and using SPF, inflation expectations. And what, it, what you have is what I showed before, this slope changes from minus 0.12 to something like zero, minus 0 0.04. Then they also consider um, instrumenting now for, with 20 lakhs of Romer Romer shocks. What I want to highlight here is that this point estimate that changed from minus 0.12 to minus 0 0.04 now changes from something like minus 0 0.6, so almost like an order of magnitude larger, to something like minus 0 0.05. So it changes quite a bit when you use Romer Romer shocks instead of using only lag variables as instruments. They also consider the Gali Gerler Lopez Salido specification. What that means in practice is that they're going to have, as instruments, no longer Romer Romer shocks, but they're going to have four lags of inflation, two lags of the unemployment rate, wage inflation, and output gap lags of those as instruments uh, in their main specification. And now this point estimate changes to minus 0.25, uh, and it flattens to something like minus 0.2. And then they keep the lag structure in the instruments constant, but they extend their sample going beyond 2008, and they extend it all, all the way to 2021. And what you have here is something that starts looking very similar to the first result a little bit with a little bit of a smaller slope. So here the slope changes from minus 0.05, it changes quite a bit, and then it goes back again. So, so when, I, when I say that this, this is not a, 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 new, a new problem of, of, of this estimate, but a problem that this literature has faced for, for quite a, a, a bit of time, um, this is what I mean. So here I'm, 
I'm borrowing um, this table again from my previous Blackboard Modeler and Stocks paper in the JEL, um, which I like so much that unconsciously I cited twice in the same slide. Um, and, and what they show here is that you have like a, a bunch of different permutations that you could use in order to estimate the Phillips curve. You could use PC inflation, core CPI, you could use the GDP deflator. You could use different like variables of the pooling variable. You could use gaps, you could use HP filters, you could detrend, you could do a myriad of things. The same thing with inflation expectations. You could use realized inflation, you could use vintage data, you could use SPFs, you could use the Michigan survey, so on and so forth. So what they do is that they compute all these permutations for us in order to illustrate the problem that when you do that, the range values, for example, for the forward-looking component of the Phillips curve and the slope of the Phillips curve is massive. You could get something in any point from minus 0 0.25 to 0 0.25 and the forward-looking component from any value from minus one to two. Um, so my suggestion here is that this paper would benefit a lot from trying to come up with a metric for this weak instrument problem and the effects on the estimated coefficients in a similar way to this paper. Is it, is it true that when you estimate time varying parameters, this weak instrument problem becomes larger, becomes smaller, it's as large as we knew it to be? I think that, that would be very useful. Um, so, so just let me conclude with that. So, so I, I think it's an interesting exercise. I'm looking forward to future iterations. And, and just to, uh, to be repetitive, repetitive, I'm gonna repeat my main suggestions. One is um, come up with a metric to quantify the importance of these changes in slopes. Um, I suggest one, which is the effect of different values of the estimated slope of the Phillips curve on inflation dynamics. Um, the second one would be to um, come up with a benchmark in which we can learn what views of the world can we reject or can we not reject with this time, parameter uh, time varying parameter model. And the third one would be to document a little bit systematically the sensitivity of lambda and also the gammas, the forward and backward looking component of inflation both to specification choice and to uh, weak instruments. Um, that's all. Uh, first, thank you for this uh, valuable, um, uh, thanks, for these uh, comments and suggestions. I feel they are very um, useful, and we will definitely take those into account and look more into this. Uh, let me uh, briefly respond to several points and to just to share some of my thoughts. Um, one of your points is regarding the um, uh, benchmark model and which words we are rejecting. I think this is a very good point, and actually, in this context, we are comparing our results with the time uh, with the constant parameter model, as you mentioned, that which is a natural benchmark, and actually, we are doing so. And uh, in one of our results, so let me. In one of our main results showing the time varying parameter path of the slope of the Phillips curve. Um, we can see that the constant parameter model result is not rejected over time in that subsample. However, if we use our time varying parameter estimator, then this path is um, changing over time, and we can see that at the beginning of the sample before 1990s, our results is also significantly um, different from zero, which is uh, uh, similar to the constant parameter model, so it's significant. While in the second half of the subsample, that is after 1990s, this result is becoming indistinguishable from zero. So this kind of reflect the difference between uh, our time varying parameter model and the benchmark, the constant parameter model, I would say this can actually be one of the advantage of our method, which we can tell, uh, which is differently from the constant parameter model results. Okay. But it is true that we can extend our discussion and discuss more on uh, how our results are different from the uh, benchmark from this constant parameter model. And thank you for, for this point. Um, and another point is that 
So how to interpret the time variation in this lambda t? So in this discussion, one of the suggestions is that we can look at the um, components lambda multiply the output gap. So in this current stage, what we are looking at is uh, the slope, the lambda t directly. But I, I agree, it's an interesting point to look at the, um, uh, this product lambda t multiplied by this uh, u gap. Um, I think what we can do to stress this uh, change in lambda t is that we can show the relative change in the coefficient in this lambda t. Actually, I can recall that the uh, change, the relative change is something between 30% uh, to 60%. So in the parameter itself, it is actually changing a lot. But I agree that suppose we look at the components, the change is not much, which is consistent uh, with uh, what you find. Um, and also, I think this is also related to our method, which can capture a smaller magnitude of time variation, which is not considered in the literature. And the magnitudes of time variation is uh, the sample size to the power minus one half or smaller, with uh, which standard tests will not capture with probability approaching to one, even in the limit. So this, I will say, can also be one of the advantage of our Paper, but we can, of course, uh, stress more on this point and discuss more about that. And thanks for this point. And the last point is about the sensitivity to specifications. And it is, um, well, it is the same problem uh, we face in the constant parameter model, as you show in Stock's paper. We have uh, many different results based on different specifications. And here is the same. We also face these results in our time varying parameter uh, model for different specifications. Um, I, think, I think it is a good idea to, to investigate what could be um, uh, what could affect the result systemic, uh, uh, systematically. Uh, but the main challenge I think here is that the number of specifications is quantitatively large. Suppose we fix the choice of the inflation measurements, we still have different choices of forcing variables or future inflations and the IV set. So there are too many choices of that. But I agree, it would be super interesting to look into this, what could affect the results. And I remember there is a question about whether this time varying thing could, for example, the instruments can be weaker and weaker across time. I think this is a very interesting point. Um, but I, um, at the second thought, I think our method is, uh, since we make it thanks, robust, to, uh, in, uh, robust to weak IV, so no matter how weak it is, our estimate and bands will be robust to that. I think this is also something we can stress more in the paper. Uh, and thank you for raising this. Um, I think I, I'm almost running out of time. I will let me just uh, respond to these several points and I will think more about the remaining points. And thank you again for your um, very valuable uh, comments. We will think about that. So, th thanks a lot. Uh, we are a bit tight on time, but uh, let me just uh, ask whether there, there is a question in the, in the audience. So actually, uh, there, there's one uh, question online from uh, Randall Fairbrugge, who's, who's asking whether you have thought about using alternative unemployment gap measures. And he, he, he suggests, uh, so he has work where using these, using these measures, they don't find any flattening of the, of the Phillips curve. That's a good point. Actually, we have tried many specifications, so different choices of, of forcing variables. Uh, for example, we have tried other measurements of unemployment gap, no matter two-sided detrended or real-time one-sided detrended, or the labor share and, uh, uh, and also output gap. Uh, we have tried many specifications, and generally the result we obtain is, uh, is robust. We get this flattening of the slope of Phillips curve almost for uh, all the specifications we try. So, but it's a good point that we can try um, all of these uh, specifications, and which is also linked to the suggestion by Juan about the, uh, what could be the systematically uh, the reason that affect the results of, um, uh, of the slope of Phillips curve. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much.